Hi, my name is Dirk Bezemer at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. I will explore with you what money is and how money, credit and debt and the financial sector are important to our economy. We are now in a credit crisis or a debt crisis. So it seems a lot of money disappeared recently and we are in trouble. Where has this money gone? Where did it come from in the first place? What is money? Now, Woody Allen supposedly joked that economics is about money and why it is good. So let's ask some economics students here at my university. Well, money is um, just a tool to um, improve or, let's say, yeah, make life easier. It, um, it substitutes barter trade. Uh, geld is a smear middle for the, for the rail handle. It represents a kind of kind of value we are paying for for some services or some products or some goods. The, the coins, uh, the paper money, but also my bank card. Te weinig geld. <laughs> ja, ik denk met de crisis uh, ja, dat er natuurlijk altijd wel te weinig geld is. You may think that money was invented to make exchange easier. You could imagine that at some point in prehistory. A hunter just shot a deer and a farmer has some carrots and they want to exchange but the meat is worth much more than the carrots so they need to invent something to pay each other the difference. In this story that something would be money. Be it in the form of shells or lumps of gold or silver or whatever. And then later in the story banks would appear to store the money and to lend out money from people who have too much money, who are the savers, to those who have too little money, the investors. And that's when credit and debt systems appeared. So money came first and then credit and debt in this story. The problem with this story is, it may sound plausible, but there is very little historical or archaeological evidence for it. Plus it has some logical problems. There is a lot of evidence and arguments to believe that debt came first and money later when people started to use their debt tokens, their debt symbols, as money. Now why would this be the case? Well, in the first place it would be logical because of seasonal production. In ancient societies dependent on seasonal production, food and other products come onto the market at different times of the year. So the farmer has perhaps not yet harvested the carrots, while the hunter already shot the deer with no fridge to keep it in. So what did they do? The farmer accepts the meat now on the promise that he will pay the carrots later, as they come available. So at this moment, the farmer has accepted a debt, which is a promise to pay the hunter in the future. So here we have a relation between a creditor and a debtor. Now with more people than just these two in any one society and with different products you can imagine you quickly get a complex web of credit relations. Also each debt contract may have a lot of detail. Not only how much is owed but also when it needs repaying, in what form, what the interest is and so on. For all this you will need a system to record it. So the upshot is, as soon as you had specialization of production, with different people producing different things at different times of the year, then you need to record credit and debt, what we now call double entry bookkeeping. Albert Einstein seems to have said that humanity made three great inventions in prehistory, fire, the wheel and double entry bookkeeping. Now this is all really interesting, but how does money come in? And why do we need to know all this? Well, money is simply debt symbols, debt tokens, which are used as payments. After all, a debt is a claim on future goods and services, as we just saw. So it's really worth something, and that means you can pay with it. Let's say the debt is written on a clay tablet. The hunter can now use the tablet to pay someone else like a fisherman. And as the debt tokens are moved out of that particular trading relationship, there will also be the need for some external authority to assert their value, like kings or chiefs proclaiming the value of money. This also opens up the possibility of central clearing, which greatly simplifies things. 
if A has a claim on B and B has a claim on C and C has a claim on A, then they could all physically pay each other the clay tablets. But it's also possible to settle without any of these debt tokens changing hands. So the clay tablets can be left in a central storage. Only the ownership over the clay tablets, over the debt tokens, would change hands. Now suddenly, society can easily manage a much larger number of credit and debt relations by central clearing. You don't need to carry it all around. In fact, that's why in an ancient society called Sumer, in what is now Iraq, thousands of clay tablets were found in the desert sands, stored in temple ruins, the central banks of their day. People did not carry clay tablets around, but their ownership just changed hands while they were stored in temple vaults. Just as today we pay by transferring ownership of part of our bank accounts. So our modern financial system is in fact very old. Credit, debt, interest, denominations of money, clearing systems, central banks, they all go back thousands of years. Now, here is why all this matters to us today. Just as in ancient times, money still is debt. And just as in ancient times, this is why money, which for us is bank credits, money is so important for exchange and economic growth. Just look at the modern British five pound note. On it, you can read, I will pay to the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds signed by the chief cashier of the Bank of England. Now, no one will actually take this note to the Bank of England to get five pounds, because what would the chief cashier give you in return? Of course, five pounds, so another note. But these words on the pound note clearly show the origin of our modern money. Money is a form of debt, an obligation to pay on demand. There is another way to see that money is debt also today. And this is that new money comes into existence as people increase their debt. The quantity of money in circulation increases as banks make new loans. There's nothing secret about this. You can read about this on the websites of central banks, for instance. But it is a bit confusing. Since the word lending suggests this is about something that already exists, you can only lend out what you have, after all. But this is not the case with money, which banks lend out. It's better to say that banks create money. They lend it into existence. They make it out of nothing, as some people like to say. Well, out of paper and ink, that is, or out of the bits in their computers nowadays. So how does the quantity of money increase as banks make loans? Let's look at an example. Suppose I want to buy a red Maserati, which is an expensive sports car. This costs 220,000 euros, which I do not have at the moment. So I go to a bank and ask for a loan, in this case a consumption loan. If the loan officer knows his job, he will say no. But five or six years ago, he would have offered me a cup of coffee and settled the business for me. Now, if they do that, what happens? Do they wait until someone comes in through the back door with a bag of money so they can give me my money for the loan? Of course not. All that happens is I have to show my credit card or passport maybe, and there will be some typing on computer keyboards, some signatures, that's it. Now, the bank has given me a 220,000 euro loan. What this means is that the bank promises to pay my bills up to the maximum of 220,000 euro. They increased my current account balance. They did this by changing some numbers in their computer. New money has been created. Now, I cross the street to the Maserati dealer and buy the car. Again, I do not give the dealer a bag of money, but I show my credit card and ID, I sign a form, and that is it. What happens is that the bank people transfer 220,000 euros from my account to the account of the Maserati dealer. Again, by changing some numbers in their computer. I have now spent the money that was earlier created. This is real money. 
The Maserati dealer can use it to go shopping, to pay his employees, to decorate his house or whatever, as real as you like. So, new money has been created because I took out a loan and the bank wanted to lend. Suppose that I decided in the morning that borrowing 220,000 euros to buy an expensive car was really a stupid idea and I wouldn't have done it. Then in the evening there would be 220,000 euros less in the economy compared to the case where I did go ahead and took the loan. And the Maserati dealer would not be able to spend it on shopping or decorating. It wouldn't exist. So lending really does create new money. We can use this story to see a number of important things about money. First, we don't need to save before lending can take place. On the contrary, it's the loan which creates new money. And by moving that money into other people's current accounts at the bank as I pay, it can then be saved or used for payment again. So loans create deposits and savings, not the other way around. Our Maserati dealer, for example, can choose not to spend his money but save it for a rainy day. However, this is only possible because I borrow the money first and the bank created it. The other thing we can see is that money creation in itself does not lead to imbalances or instability. It's not scary. What happens is that when the Maserati has been bought, the bank has an additional asset which is its claim on me, I need to repay the loan. It also has an additional liability, which is the 220,000 euros now in the Maserati dealer's account, remember? The bank must pay this to the Maserati dealer on demand, so it's a bank liability. Now, the bank's business is to manage these long-term assets and short-term liabilities, and that is why we have banks, among other things. But there is no imbalance in the system because of money creation. What we learned here about money is that banks, like ancient producers and traders and kings, make debt out of nothing. Because we use bank debt as money, you can say banks create money out of nothing. Many people think this is scary or worrisome or that it is new, something that bad governments have allowed after the fall of the gold standards and that only gold is real money. But in fact, money has always been debt for 5,000 years and probably much longer. Once we recognize that money is debt symbols, debt tokens that we exchange if we want to pay or trade, then we see that actually it's logical that money is made out of nothing. It's not worrisome. Debt itself is, of course, made out of nothing because it's an agreement. And just as debt can appear by agreement, think about the farmer and the hunter, it can simply disappear when the agreement stops, when debts are paid off or defaulted on. So debt comes and goes, and by implication, money comes and goes. There's no mystery about that and nothing new. So. The important insight is that money is not a thing. It is not clay or wood or gold or silver or computers or whatever material is used to record lending and borrowing transactions. Nothing else is needed for the creation of money than mutual trusts, a system of accounting and some symbol of the loan transaction and the credit relation. And just like relations are very valuable and important, even though they appear out of nothing. So money is important, even though it can be created out of nothing, just by computer keystrokes. In fact, credit and debt is what makes production possible and exchange and economic growth. Imagine the hunter and the farmer in my story would have thought that debt is bad. They would have refused to take on any debt or to use debt symbols for payment because they believed you shouldn't make money out of nothing. No exchange would have been possible. No specialization of labor would have been possible. No innovation, no development or economic growth. We would still be in prehistory. That's how important 
the innovation of double entry bookkeeping walls and credit and debt. But if debt is so helpful for economic growth, how is it possible we have a debt crisis? This is what we will explore in the next episode. So, debt is good. Bank credit helps to grow the economy. But how exactly does that work? Well, imagine an entrepreneur who borrows, say, 1 million euros in order to have a car factory built. Then the total debt of the economy increases by 1 million and the borrowed money is used to pay the builders who build the factory and it's used to pay factory workers who make the cars so the new money is now income to workers and builders and it circulates in the economy. Money creation in this example is not just debt creation. It also helps increase the total income or the gross domestic product, the GDP. In this example, both debt and income rise. If that is all that debt could ever do, then why are we in a debt crisis? The quick answer is, of course, that there can be too much debt. This means we have so much debt compared to our income that it can no longer be repaid out of income without problems. This is the situation for many firms, households, governments, indeed for many entire economies. But when you stop to think about it, it's actually strange. How can there be too much debt if each euro in debt is at least one euro of income for someone else? In that case, the ratio of debt to income does not grow. Let's call this ratio the debt burden, a number that tells us how much debt there is relative to income. When all debt is used to generate income, the debt burden will not go up. It cannot go up because there cannot be too much debt. All of it is spent in such a way that it provides us with the income that we can use to repay the debt. All is well, financially speaking. Now, to understand how a debt crisis develops, we need to make a distinction between different types of debt, between debt that helps to grow the economy and debt that does not. Because debt can also be used in other ways than to increase income. For example, if I go to the bank for a house loan, a mortgage to buy an existing house, then this increases my debt and the total debt in the economy. But it does not lead to more income because no goods and services have been produced. It just pushes up house prices a bit and therefore all house owners may feel a bit wealthier. But no wages or profits have been generated in the economy. And here is the problem. Most bank credit today is used in this way. Most bank credit is used not to help producing goods and services, but to finance transactions in housing, land, commercial property and financial products and to push up their price. This price increase is a capital gain on assets, but there is no income or profit from production of goods and services. Borrowing to invest in existing assets grows our debt, but not our future income. That means the debt burden goes up. The entrepreneur, remember, who was investing borrowed money into building a factory, was using the loan in such a way that it provides him with a future stream of income from which he can repay the debt, including interest. If the business plan is solid, there will not be a debt problem for the entrepreneur or for the economy. On the contrary, the loan will make it possible for him to increase his profits and create jobs and so help grow the economy. But in our house example, the mortgage does not lead to income creation. So the debt has to be repaid 
out of the income of whoever bought the house and took the mortgage. Part of income, therefore, say part of a monthly salary, now needs to be used to repay the debt with interest. So that money has to be subtracted from the money people can spend on goods and services in the economy. And the interest that the bank receives is also not income to anyone else. Mostly, it is simply recycled into new loans. The tricky thing is, we don't tend to worry about it. Mortgage lending causes house prices to go up. So, we see an increase in our wealth, which is the value of what we own, including our house. It goes up even more than the debt does. So we feel fine about that. But wealth is not income. In the economy, income does not go up due to mortgage lending, but debt does go up. And the ratio of debt to income, the debt burden, is rising all the time. To see this, just think of an example. In a market with 100 identical houses, each value at 1,000 euros, what happens if for some reason there is a price increase so that I take out a mortgage to buy one house for 1,200 euros? Well, that transaction will set the market price. Each house owner who wants to know the current value of his house will look at the latest transaction. The valuation of his house will go up by 200 euros. And if this happens for every house, that's 100 times 200 euros, which is a total of 20,000 euros. And house values are part of people's wealth, remember? So that's how rich they think they are. Which means that my mortgage of 1,200 euros has led to an increase in total wealth of 20,000 euros. 99 people are now richer, not because their income has gone up, but because of debt creation by one person and his bank. So here we found what debt can do, apart from increasing income. It can increase wealth, if it is used not to invest in production, but to invest in existing assets, in houses or land or shares or whatever financial products. In fact, once this starts, people may start feeling so much richer that they think it is safe and attractive to borrow even more. Getting an additional mortgage to invest in a booming housing market seems a good idea, or perhaps the mortgage can be increased a bit to pay for that new car. So you easily get a process that reinforces itself. Debt increases wealth, which increases debt, which increases wealth, and so on and so on. Meanwhile, remember the debt ratio. Debt is rising, income is not. So the debt ratio or the debt burden is going up all the time. So it's more difficult to repay debt from income. Is that actually a problem? With so much wealth, surely there's another way to repay debts if you have to, not out of income, but by selling some assets. This idea is just a reason that people will borrow without a worry while asset prices are rising. They think they can always sell assets to pay their debts if they have to. Asset values are rising faster than debts, after all. So this market is not self-correcting, the way we like to think about markets with demand and supply. There is no tendency to equilibrium, the way we learn about it in economics textbooks. If the price for carrots goes through the roof, you will want to eat other things. So prices go up, demand goes down, and then the price falls back again. There is a tendency towards equilibrium. But with houses, things are different. If prices go up, Everyone wants to own a house to share in the capital gains. So demand for houses goes up more than supply. And with falling asset prices, everyone wants to get rid of assets. So supply increases more than demand. This instability is even bigger 
if borrowing can quickly inflate the market. Money can be created instantaneously at the keystroke and be poured into the market. Something that can never happen in the market for carrots. And this is the reason why market economies have always had booms and bubbles in their asset markets, which can grow really large and destructive. And the biggest asset market in each economy is the property market for land and houses. And most credit that banks today create is mortgage credit. You can see how powerful that combination is. It's been quite a story, but now we can start seeing how credit and debt harm the economy instead of helping it. During the boom, there are three harmful effects which tend to go unnoticed. One is when asset prices rise quickly, banks will want to invest more in asset markets and less in the production of goods and services, which gives lower returns. Another effect is when the debt burden increases, more and more of our household income is going to debt repayment. And this means less money is available for purchasing goods and services. In both ways, the economy suffers from a financial boom, though this will be masked by the abundant purchasing power that debt itself provides. And finally, with rising asset markets, there will be big gains for those who already own assets, the rich, and much smaller gains for those who need to borrow in order to obtain assets, the middle classes. So a financial boom will increase inequality, which is also bad for economic growth. And it all started with this simple distinction. Is credit used to support the production of goods and services? Or is it used to invest in and inflate asset markets? This difference is not a distinction you will find in economics textbooks or even in advanced macroeconomic models. In fact, the absence of this distinction is a key reason why the credit crisis and all that followed came as such a surprise to most economists. On the one hand, we have credit going to the economy of goods and services where it pays for wages and profits. On the other hand, credit going to property and asset markets, pushing up asset prices. The first type grows the economy and is mostly helpful. The second type of credit may help the economy, but also increases the debt burden and it introduces new risk and it's harmful at high levels. So now we've looked at the boom and its harmful effects, but while the boom is bad enough already, what about the bust? So we've seen that financial booms are not only good for the economy while they last, but the worst thing about them is that they cannot go on forever. What will ultimately stop the boom is that with higher debts, people need to devote a larger part of their income to monthly loan repayment and interest. There is a limit to how much they can miss and still pay for their living, so debt growth will always have to stop at the point where people cannot afford to take on new loans. And since rising asset prices depend on increasing debt levels, the end of borrowing means the end of the asset price boom. And then what? Well, if house prices have been increasing for a long time because of all this borrowed money, then in the end, most of the price of a house will be due to debt creation rather than due to any real demand for living space. So when house prices stop increasing because people cannot afford more mortgages borrowing, then suddenly most people see no more reason to buy a house. Anyone wanting to sell a house now will have to offer it for a lower price to find a buyer. In fact, there is no reason 
why the price should not go down all the way to the initial level that reflects the real demand for living space, where it was before debt started pushing up the price. After all, without house prices rising, the only remaining reason to buy a house is because of the value it offers as a place to live in. And that was the value we started with before the mortgage boom came along. Now, that initial price is much, much lower than what houses sell for at the top of a debt-driven house price boom. And the longer and larger the boom was, the more house prices will now fall. Once this starts, everything goes into reverse. All that made the boom seem like such a great time now makes the bust a truly miserable time. A little borrowing by some made for great capital gains due to rising house prices for all. Now a little less borrowing by some makes for large losses through falling house prices all around. And just like rising house prices trigger more demand and more borrowing, now a small house price decline causes further declines in demand and in borrowing. Also, the fact that your mortgage was fixed while your house price was rising made you rich without doing any work on the way up. Now the problem is that debt levels are fixed just like before, but house prices are falling and this makes you poorer without anything you can do about it. In fact, with falling house prices, soon some people will have larger debts than their house is worth. First there was just a lot of debt with even higher house prices, so no problem. And now there is a lot of debt, but with low house prices and not enough asset value to balance the debt, there is a problem. People turn from positive net worth to negative net worth, and suddenly credit is not a free lunch, but a problem. It's also debt, and you have to pay it, with too little to pay it from. This is so scary, suddenly everyone wants to pay off as much of the debt as possible, perhaps by selling their house. So falling house prices increase the supply of houses, which pushes down the price more, which increases supply, and so on. Soon enough, with falling asset prices, repaying debt by selling your house is simply not an option. The only way to fully repay debt is now out of income. And this is where the debt burden comes in again. This ratio of debt to income was forgotten during the boom, but now it's glaringly obvious that income is all you have to pay your debt from. But remember, debt has risen much faster than income, so the debt burden is really high. A lot of income has to be devoted to debt repayment. And that means it cannot be used to buy goods and services. As demand for goods and services falls, GDP growth may fall or even turn negative. And it gets worse. The other thing that happens is that banks will reduce their lending. With falling prices of houses and other assets, banks suddenly have much less security. So this makes them much more careful to issue loans. Firms in the real sector suddenly find it much harder to obtain loans for investment and growth. And to make matters worse, their customers are buying much less since they're busy repaying loans. More money now flows as loan repayment out of the economy to banks than before. That may be good for banks, but the fall in house prices, which is their security on mortgages, is much larger. So banks still do not lend. The combination of these forces, more money flowing into banks, less lending coming from banks, this is called a credit crunch. Suddenly, the economy is choking for lack of credit. Money is being pulled out of the normal economic process from all sides. This developed as a result of the normal economic process. It seems as if financial boom, bust, instability and crisis is a normal outcome rather than an exceptional shock to the system. Now, strange as it sounds, that is actually the case. Our economic system is built to produce crises. Just like the boom, the bust process is not like an equilibrium. Remember our carrot example, where a lower price for carrots means you want to buy more of them, so the price rises again. But as we've seen, stability and equilibrium through supply and demand 
do not work on asset markets. Now declining prices for houses and stocks means you want to have even less of it. No one wants to hold assets that decrease in price. So falling prices produce even lower prices. They don't move back to equilibrium. They spiral out of control, upward or downward. And if the banks cut back lending to real businesses, then there is even less income to pay for the existing debt. This means that the bust reinforces itself and will only reverse if debt is back at a sustainable level, which may be really low. In the real world, this happens again and again, and that's no coincidence. It's built into the system. Time and again, people come to believe that the price of something will keep going up and they can get rich without working. This ranges from the Dutch tulip bubble in 1637, the British South Sea bubble in 1720, recurring financial panics in the US, such as in 1873 and again in 1893, both because of railroad speculation, Charles Ponzi's scheme in the US, which collapsed in 1920, the US real estate and stock market boom, which burst in 1929, and then the US savings and loans debacle in the 1980s, the Black Tuesday New York stock market bust in 1987, the US stock market dot-com bubble, which burst in 2000, and now the US mortgage derivative bubble, which burst in 2007. And in addition to all this, many house price crashes occurred. For instance, in the Netherlands in 1979, in Japan in 1990, or in Sweden in the early 1990s. What all these crises have in common is that they happen in financially well-developed economies and that each financial crisis starts with a boom in property or asset markets. We've seen how investment in these markets increases mm -hmm. debt, but not income. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it sets the scene for a crisis by raising the debt burden. We've also seen that banks and investors and consumers all benefit enormously from a boom. They don't have any reason to stop it while it lasts, until it's too late. So the boom is built into the very fabric of our economy, and so is the bust. This may sound obvious, but the implication is this. We should stop thinking about our economy as a system which will always go back to equilibrium. We should recognize that it is always moving towards the next crisis. And then we should think of policies and regulations to tame the boom and to prevent the bust. So let's step back. What have we learned? The ability of banks to create money as they land means that they also create debt. And if this debt is used only to inflate the prices of houses and other assets and to consume, then what follows after that boom is a credit crisis and a debt deflation and a recession. It's only natural. Or is it? What should we do after this, our greatest financial crisis ever? How do we harness credit for growth and stability while dealing with the dark side of credit, which is too much debt? We've seen that money is debt and that the wrong allocation of debt, mainly to property and financial markets, were the key reasons we are now in a crisis. So what should we do now? Many different solutions are being thrown around because there's no agreement on what the cause of the problem is. Many of the debates are about symptoms, not causes. For instance, bankers' bonuses or consumer confidence. But we won't solve anything by letting bankers promise they will behave in the future or by telling households who are deeply in debt that they should start spending. These arguments distract from the real issues. This is especially true for the government deficit. For some reason we decided that the real problem is that governments spend too much.
By cutting their spending, they should make sure that their debt goes down and then all will be well. Except that it won't. What actually matters is the debt burden, the ratio of debts to income, not the debt level. If by cutting government spending we are reducing our incomes faster than the debt, then the debt burden will be rising instead of falling. This is now happening in several European countries. The second problem is that the focus itself on government debt is mistaken. Government debt levels only increased when they took over enormous bank debts after 2007, after the private debt boom turned into a bust and banks were called out. Government debt is the consequence, not the cause of the crisis. Private debt levels are the cause and private debt levels are still high. With low income growth, repaying private debt down to sustainable levels may take a decade or more. Since debt repayment drains money away from the economy, this means a decade of recession or very low growth. Remember, running up these debts has taken us two decades, so how long will repaying them take? In fact, it's very likely many loans will not be fully repaid at all, given our much lower capacity now to repay debt. Many of the loans which are now still being serviced are already bad loans in all probability. We will have to face that fact sooner or later. And until we do, we are in a so-called debt deflation. Low growth due to debt repayments and falling asset prices. The alternative to this dismal scenario is that we do something now to reduce the debt burden. And since debt is what banks live from, in consequence many banks will have to downsize quite a lot. So the flip side of debt reduction is reducing the financial system in size. All loans are held in a financial system. So too many loans means too large a financial system. This is the key reason we must cut down the banking system to size relative to the economy. So instead of merely saving banks as we do now, we do need to start thinking about intelligent ways to shrink banks. If we don't, then the flow of money out of the economy into this oversized financial system to serve our oversized debt burden will continue to be a drag on growth. We must make the banking sector a force for good again, something that helps rather than hurts our economy. This means two things. We need to deal with the consequences of the past, which were high debt levels, and we need to regulate for the future, preventing banks from issuing again too much debt to property and financial markets. So let's agree on one simple point. Any policies to help us out of this debt crisis must address the debt problem. It's no rocket science, is it? So next time you hear or read that we should reform our labor markets or cut wages or bail out banks, just ask yourself, do these policies do something about the debt problem? And guess what? A lot of them do not. What's now holding back growth is lack of investment and demand and this is because firms and especially households have so much debt, for instance as home mortgages, that too much income must be devoted to repaying this and all this money cannot be spent in the economy. In Japan they did not tackle this problem after their asset bubble burst in 1990 and this has led to decades of low growth and recession. If the amount of debt is too large to be maintained, then the longer we avoid facing this fact, the longer our economy suffers. This is not to say that the downsizing process which we will need to enter will be painless. Loan assets and financial instruments on banks' balance sheets is what many institutions like pension funds have invested our savings in. So, if these assets turn out to be worthless, that will cost us savings. But remember, much of these are bad loans already. We just need to face up to it. Other problems will arise because if loans are not being repaid, this weakens banks' balance sheets so that they may stop creating new productive loans, hurting the economy again. But again, 
banks are already hoarding money instead of lending it to firms for investments, just as they've been doing in Japan for two decades. So one way or another, we are in for problems. But it's best to bite the bullet now instead of going for a slow Japan scenario. We need to think through the consequences as far as we can. And then we need to isolate and protect those parts of the banking system which are vital to the economy. That is, lending directly to the real sector, the payment system and vital savings functions. Much of the rest of the financial system may well spontaneously shrink once we stop supporting it with taxpayers' money. It is unclear how much the economy will suffer from this. We are now told we need to save banks in order to save our economy. But large parts of the banking system had little to do with the real economy to start with. So perhaps we can do without them much more easily than we are now telling ourselves. In any case, keeping all of the banking system is simply not an option. It is more than twice the level it was only a few decades ago and we don't have the income to service that level of debt and still have decent growth rates. So ending support to parts of the financial system, letting it shrink, is one part of the solution. But this is a long-term process. Shorter term relief could be achieved by a consortium of banks led by a public institution or a dedicated government agency, buying up loan assets such as mortgages from banks and then isolating them. These would be so-called bad loans in a bad bank. In this way, the loans do no longer burden banks' balance sheets. And by then allowing longer mortgage repayment schedules, households with high mortgage debt levels could be helped through a difficult period. A long-term public investor could hold the loan assets until house prices have recovered and then sell at a profit. And even if that is not fully possible, any public costs of these policies must be weighed against their public benefits. Policies like these were applied in the previous Dutch mortgage crisis around 1980. These are ways to reduce and to manage the large debt burden we have now. The other challenge is to redirect lending to productive purposes. Combined, this means bringing down the ratio of debt to income. In order to achieve this, we should discourage banks to lend with the purpose of blowing up asset prices. For example, using the current Basel bank regulations, mortgage or stock market loans could be weighed as being more risky in banks' capital ratios. And this prohibits banks from creating too many of these loans. Another proposal which has been made in the UK is taxing such loan assets on banks' balance sheets. This will both discourage such lending and it will provide government tax revenues to pay for other policies and for its own debt burden. And there are other options. The most proactive measure to get productive lending going again is to have a dedicated investment bank. For instance, the Germans did this when they set up the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, or KFW, in 1948. Literally a credit institution for reconstruction of their economy. The KFW indeed played a vital role in the development of the German economy. And it continues to do so with currently a loan portfolio of over 70 billion euros. About a third of this is in building up environmental protection know-how and applications such as solar cells. The other two-thirds is investment in public transport, sanitation, small and medium enterprises and startups, and project finance related to German exports. This is how credit can actually help the economy. Now we have another crisis, globally the biggest in 80 years. Will there be a revolution in economics again? Recognizing that there is something big we've missed all the time. What will the new economics be about? In one word, debt. This is the elephant in the room 
that economists have managed to miss for decades now. This is the revolution in economic thinking that we need. No one knows if that revolution will occur. If it does, it may have started already and it will be a long-term thing. Remember, the stock market crash that started the 1930s Great Depression was in 1929. Keynes wrote his book in 1936 and widespread acceptance of his policies came only after the Second World War, nearly two decades after the crash. We are only five years into our Great Recession now, so we may have some time to go. And meanwhile, we are cutting down investment in our education, health and infrastructure systems. Businesses are going bankrupt in their hundreds. Unemployment is rising to levels not seen in 30 years. Tensions within Europe are rising. Let's hope it doesn't take us two decades and a war to find our way out of this mess. So far, the role of economics as a science and of economic policies in practice have not been particularly helpful. The neglect of credit and debt got us into this mess. And the neglect of credit and debt now means that our politicians burden us with policies that do not address the actual problems. We should restructure debt levels resulting from past mistakes so that they will not hinder recovery today. We should regulate banks and financial markets so that they do not again produce so much unproductive debt. And even better, they should produce more productive debt. But we can only do this when we first start thinking again about how our economy is shaped by credit and debt.